Development Program. The Caribbean and African Health Network, CAN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating and giving space to black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members and friends. Some weeks will vary and will include other panel members such as pharmacists, specialist nurses and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell and many more. We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences and ask questions to our black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATHIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. morning um, thank you for being here today and it's just delighted that you can all you can join us well the weather's a bit rubbish outside if you're in the north if you're in Manchester I know that you join us from a wide range of, of um, places but if you are up north you I know it's raining outside so perhaps this is a nice alternative to being out in the rain so my name's Ngozi Ediosage. I'm one of the um, advisors for the Caribbean African Health Network and um, this morning, where I'm delighted to invite Miss um, Evelyn Mensa. She is a consultant ophthalmic surgeon, so an eye doctor, and she's got lots of experience. Um, she works in central Middlesex as a consultant, but she's also a great advocate for black health as well. So I would welcome you to um, listen to her talk today. As usual, we'll have time, to, uh, time at the end for you to ask questions. Of, of Dr. Evie, and also um, you can do that by putting your questions in the chat or you can um, raise your hand. But I'm really looking forward to this session because um, it's not often that we have um, eye problems where I don't encounter them a lot in my experience, but when they are, you are really concerned about them and um, any questions at all, put them through to Evie. In fact, they say the eyes are the window to the soul. So I will hand over to Evie to, uh, take us through her presentation. And thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you so much for um, inviting me uh, this morning. I'm just turning my little fun off. Um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me um, to talk to you about um, eye conditions and um, eye health. Um, I don't know whether or not the sessions that you run are um, interactive, but I'm quite happy for you know people to ask questions as we, as I go through um, the presentation. Right, so I'm just going to just share my screen. Um, let me just get it into presentation mode. And see, usually um, what we tend to do is uh, you present and then we ask people ask questions. But if there are things that if you've got any burning questions, this is you know this session is for you. Uh, um, our audience so you know um, we wouldn't stop you if there are things that you really want to to, to ask but you can all pop right well I'm happy I'm, 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 I'm happy to be to be um you know for people to just if they if they want to shout out you know just to say you know what they want I'll, to I'll keep an eye on the chat for you so you can just concentrate on the uh, the talk all right okay so my name's um okay. Evelyn Mensah actually a lot of people call me Evie I've been called Evie since school days um and um as Ngozi, Ngozi's just said I'm a a consultant ophthalmic surgeon. So I'm an eye surgeon uh, based at Central Middlesex Hospital, which is part of a, a wider uh, trust in Northwest London called London Northwest University Healthcare Trust. And in that organization, as well as being the um, 
the clinical lead for op ophthalmology. I'm also the co-lead for the sector. And I'm also something called a RES expert, which is a workforce race equality standard um, expert. So health equity um, is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. So what I'm going to talk to you today um, during your health hour are eye conditions, diagnosis and management. And I did do a talk last year on diabetic retinopathy, which is my speciality. Um, but what I just want to talk about is um, about how your eyes, everybody's eyes are very, very different. Um, no two eyes are the same. So I just wanted to start off by giving you some top tips for healthy eyes. Now we're all familiar with having our visual acuity measured and it's very important to have regular sight tests. And the reason to have a sight test is that your eyes can give a lot of information about what is happening with your general health. For example, if you are suffering with diabetes, you can have diabetic changes at the back of your eyes on the retina. If your cholesterol is possibly high, there can be evidence of that also in the back of your eyes. And if you have high blood pressure, again, features of that can be present in the back of your eyes. So ideally, you should have an eye test every two years. Now, I know what you might be thinking, oh my gosh, if I go into the optometrist or into the optician's practice, they're going to want to sell me a pair of glasses. I know that is true. They do run a business, but I still think it's important if you could just check your eyes every two years, because there are certain conditions that are that happen earlier and are more predominant in the Black African, Black Caribbean community. So it's really important to have a healthy diet for your eyes. And all the things that possibly our grandparents would tell us that we should be eating, all the green stuff like spinach, kale and everything, you know, all those green leafy products are what's actually good advice because a lot of the sort of pigments that you have in your macula, which is the part of your retina that you see things in fine, clear detail are actually extracted from lutein and zeaxanthine, which are in green leafy vegetables, such as spinach and kale. So spinach and kale are actually very good for your eyes, but it's really important to have a healthy balanced diet um, to reduce any risk of eye disease. And also vitamins A, C and E which are actually found in fruits and vegetables. So if you could eat about five portions of fruit and vegetables a day, vitamins A, C and E are very good for your retina health. If you have a family history of macular degeneration, and a lot of people think that macular degeneration doesn't happen in the black community, but it does. We see patients in my unit, certainly who are black, who suffer with macular degeneration, people think tend to think, well, the, the studies will tell you that it's, it's just in white people. But in my unit, about a third of our patients with macular degeneration are actually um, black African Caribbean or South Asian. So it's important to keep your eyes healthy with a healthy diet that's rich in green, green uh, leafy veg and in fruits. If you have glasses and they're prescribed, wear them. There's a myth out there in the community that if you wear glasses, it, it actually makes your eyes worse. It does not. So it's very, very important to wear prescribed glasses. Wearing glasses does not make you short-sighted or long-sighted. You're long-sighted or short-sighted in the first instance. So it's important to wear your glasses. Um, when you're when you're reading, it's important to do something called the 20-20-20 rule, all right, which means that you need to take breaks, especially when we're using things like our devices and things like that. It's important to, it's very, very important that you relieve any strain 
on your eyes using the 20-20-20 rule. So what does the 20-20-20 rule mean? What it means is that every 20 minutes, if you're look, looking at your device, whether it's your computer, your laptop or whatever, every 20 minutes, look at something 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And that just relaxes the muscles in your eyes. Don't forget to blink because what tends to happen a lot when people are using devices is that they stare at the screen and they don't blink. And if you don't blink, it makes your eyes dry out. Now, if it's sunny, you should really wear sunglasses, ideally one with a CE mark, all right? One with a CE mark that definitely has a UV filter within it, all right? It filters out the ultraviolet light. So the British standard mark um, for um, this would, would, is what it looks like on the right there. Um, if you are a smoker, really and truly tr stop smoking, stop smoking. Um, there's evidence to suggest that certain eye conditions are worse if you smoke. This is certainly true of macular degeneration. There are not many modifiable factors for macular degeneration, but you know, because it happens if you get old, as you get older, and usually it's more common if you're female, you can't do anything about being female and getting older. But if you smoke, stopping smoking can certainly help. So um, drivers, when you're, if you're a driver, your vision has to be at a, a particular level on the chart. This is something called the Snellen chart. It's the chart that we normally use to measure when patients come to the eye clinic or when they go to the opticians. And the line that you have to get to is something called the six, the 612 line on the chart. Now, um, you've got to have one eye that reaches that level to be able to drive. And also people who drive, if you are suffering with diabetes or if you are suffering with glaucoma, um, which is a bit more common in, in the black community, if you've had treatments like laser treatment or anything like that, the, the DVLA and you're a driver, if you drive a car, they may ask you to do some specialized test, a specialized vision, um, visual field test called an estimate test. There are some people who can request for domiciliary eye care at home. So some people who may be housebound and they can't get to their high street opticians. And if you're eligible for an NHS uh, site test, you may be able to get a domiciliary eye care test, which is actually paid for for the, uh, for the NHS. So don't think that because you may be, you know, um, stuck at home, either for any, for whatever reason, you may be eligible for this. So you must make inquiries about it. So children um, who have problems with their eyes, the, the, the commonest way that, or the commonest reason why it is identified is usually from an eye drifting inwards or drifting outwards, all right? Something that we would call a squint. Um, an issue with children with their eyes, maybe difficulty with them concentrating on something, behavioral problems, um, a child may con complain of headaches, or they may sit too, too close to the television, or they may rub their eyes a lot. These can be reasons why um, a child may have something wrong with their eyes. And if they do, then you have to take them to the GP, get them referred to be seen by an orthoptist, usually in the hospital eye service. Now, the thing about ophthalmology or the eye, um, it's a subspecialist subject. And even though I'm sitting here as one, you know, ophthalmologist, ophthalmic surgeon, um, I'm actually specialized in one particular part of the eye. So as small as the eye is, it's a massive, massive topic, am I right? So I specialize um, with the retinal disease, medical retina, something called medical retina. I do cataract surgery, it's the commonest operation. Cataract surgery, which I'll talk about later, is something that most ophthalmologists do as a surgical procedure. But in terms of med management in the clinic, uh, my specialty is any disease of the retina, like um, diabetic retinopathy, sickle cell retinopathy, 
you know, blocked blood vessels and things like that. But it's a huge topic and it involves the lids, disease of the eyelids, the drainage system, the, you know, every single part of the eye. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about different conditions according to um, which part of the eye we're actually talking about. So the commonest, whoops, let me go back up, sorry. The commonest lump on the lid, like this, this lump here, is something called a chalasian. And this arises usually because of a blockage in the glands within your eyelids. Your eyelids secrete an oil, and sometimes the opening for the gland can get blocked off and it builds up, forming a large cyst in the eyelid. This is usually treated with antibiotics, anti antibiotic drops or antibiotic ointment. And um, in some cases, what needs to happen is you have to have a minor surgical procedure to actually drain the residual lump that gets left in the eye after it's inflamed. There are some people who have their lashes turned inwards, something called uh, trachiasis, or the lid turning in or out, which is called ectropian or entropian. And there are procedures that one can have to adjust the position of the eyelid so the lashes are not rubbing on the surface of the eye. There are some um, malignant or um, cancer type lumps that can develop in the eyelid, basal cell carcinoma. So if ever you have a suspicious lid um, lump on your lid, it is important to get this checked out in the hospital eye service. One of the commonest conditions of the lid is a condition called blepharitis. Remember, I was telling you about the glands that secrete. So you can see the glands here just behind the lash line on the margin of the lid. All right. So if that opening, that's the opening for the gland, if it gets blocked off, you can understand that the buildup of oil will happen within the tissue of the lid. But when you get over secretion of the oil in your lid margin, it can collect along the base of your lashes, causing something that looks a little bit like dandruff. And this is a condition called blepharitis. And the way to manage this condition is with something called lid hygiene. So what you do with lid hygiene is that with your face towel, your flannel, you put it in some hot water, water that your hands can tolerate. You then hold the, the hot flannel against your closed lids for a total of five minutes. You then massage your lids up and down, all right, to sort of like you're massaging your glands. And then you can get a cotton bud and you dip it in some boiled water that is cooled and you run it along the lid margin like you're putting on eyeliner. And what that does is it lifts off all the flakes and it also opens up the glands, all right, so that they can secrete the oil normally. Um, another condition that's very common involves the conjunctiva, the white layer on the surface of the eye. So we're going from front to back. Now, conjunctivitis, there are lots of different types, um, but the commonest type, which where you get a sticky discharge, will be bacterial. And there can be a conjunctivitis where you can get a watery discharge. Both eyes are pink, and that is usually viral conjunctivitis. Now, viral conjunctivitis is highly contagious. It will usually occur after a recent cold or sore throat. It's Because it's viral, it's not bacterial, it's not treated with antibiotics, but usually artificial tears and cold compresses. Bacterial conjunctivitis, on the other hand, where you get the yellowy discharge with the red eye, um, you can either just treat it by cleaning the um, lid margins, or you may need some antibiotic drops or ointment. Both are highly contagious, so you've got to avoid sharing towels. Another type of conjunctivitis is allergic conjunctivitis. Oops, let me go back up. Allergic conjunctivitis. So with allergic conjunctivitis, you get this sort of like jelly 
appearance on the surface of the eye. I mean, this is very extreme, but itchy eyes, allergic conjunctivitis um, can be really, and especially um, it can be seasonal. So it can sometimes happen when the pollen count is high or it can be a, a particular reaction to an agent, maybe your eyeliner or mascara or, or something like that, or an agent that you're using on your face. Um, now, usually what happens is that you can also get associated swelling of your eyelid and your eye is moderately red. And when your eyes are so itchy like that because of hay fever, um, it's important to use drops. Now, the drops that I usually recommend are ones, the ones that you get across the counters are just something called antihistamine drops, all right? But the process for allergy in the eyes involves release of histamine, which causes itching. So antihistamines are against the histamine that's been released, but they don't stabilize, stabilize the, the cell, the mast cell that releases the histamine. So usually I, as an ophthalmologist, would prefer to use a combined drop, a drop that is a mast cell stabilizer and a, an antihistamine. So something like a patinol, something like that. The, the, the ones you get across the counter are usually sodium chromoglycate, um, which is, but the other one I've just described is something that's been prescribed. And, and, and I think that the combined ones are actually better. Now, again, on the white surface of the eye, you can get something called a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Now, a subconjunctival hemorrhage, I have to tell you, is the most dramatic looking thing ever. And I mean, it looks like drama, drama, you know, it's like a bloodbath situation. But do you know, it does not affect your sight. All right. It's a very common thing that can happen. It does not affect your sight. It can take um, up to 14 days for it to resolve. And it it can be, though, there, there is minor evidence that it could be more common people with high blood pressure, but there's no evidence for that, all right? Usually, it's usually that you've just ruptured blood vessels, like you've just rubbed your eye or something like that. Um, but if people like this sometimes come to our eye clinic, we will just check the blood pressure. It's invariably, it's normal. Um, so don't go going to your GP, everybody, with a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Um, and there's no evidence that actually doing routine blood tests will demonstrate that you've got something wrong wrong with your clotting factors in your blood, as well as just having the, the hemorrhage on the surface of the eye, which is a bit like a bruise on the eye. You would want to see evidence of bruising in other parts of your body, like on your arms or legs, you know, with minor trauma. So if you had a subconjunctival hemorrhage and bruising on your limbs, then I would suggest that you definitely went to see your GP to get a blood test to make sure that you've not got a disorder of the blood. Um, I'm going to talk now about the cornea and dryness of the eye. The cornea is the window at the front surface of the eye, and it's made up of a number of different layer of cells. Now, do you know that when you blink, your tear film is a very complex structure? It's got three layers. It's got this inner mucin layer that adheres your tears to your cornea. It's got this middle aqueous layer, which is the fluid. And it's got this outer lipid layer, which is released by the meibomian glands. Remember the glands? I was talking about that secrete oil from your lid, they're called meibomian glands, just behind the lashes. And what that, what that oily lipid layer does is it stabilizes your tear film. So every time you blink, all right, your tears are supposed to last on the surface of your eye for 15 seconds. Now, people who suffer from dry eye will have a disorder of any one of these layers. So they may have too much, too little of the mucin layer, too much, too little of the aqueous layer, too much, too little of the lipid layer. Any instability in the normal composition of your tear film will give you dry eyes, all right? It will make your eyes feel uncomfortable. So with dry eyes, your eyes 
feel have got a gritty sensation they're sore they're uncomfortable they can be a little bit itchy not very very itchy like allergic conjunctivitis they can feel painful they can mother nature's response to having a dry eye is to make your eyes water all right so it seems like a contradiction in terms all right but the reason why your lacrimal glands, which are up on the corners of your upper eyelids, then get stimulated to release more tears is because the cornea is saying, I am dry, like feed me, because your, your cornea is fed by your tear film. And it's important that your cornea has got is clear. It's got to have clarity because that is the that's how you see. You can't see. You, you wouldn't be able to see with a very scarred cornea. You need your cornea to be clear. And your cornea does not have any blood vessels in. Most things within our body have got blood vessels passing through, giving it oxygen for your eye. Your cornea needs the oxygen in the air, in the atmosphere, dissolving within the tear film to provide nu nutrition for your cornea. All right. So. The best way to treat dry eyes is with either drops or gel. I have to say I'm more of a proponent of lubricating or dry eye drops with no preservatives. All right. Preservatives inadvertently make your eyes more drier. So personally, I prefer lubricating drops that have actually got no preservatives. I have my favorite um, eye drops, which I might talk about later if anybody asks. Now, move, moving again onto the cornea. If you are a contact lens wearer, you've got to make sure that you do good hygiene for contact lenses, because if you don't, if you don't, you can end up getting a corneal ulcer, which is an infection in the cornea. Remember, I told you, you need your cornea clear to be able to see. You do not, your cornea is like a clear glass window. You do not want anything scarring or else you cannot see. Now, a corneal ulcer can be something as tiny as that little white speck at the top. It looks tight. If you, if you can see it with the naked eye like this, it's major. And it needs it, it gets treated urgently in the hospital eye service. So somebody with even just a tiny speck like that would have antibiotic drops going in every hour. It's common in contact lens wearers, whether they're soft or hard contact lenses. All right. If this was to progress, it could end up being something like this, which is I mean, this is high risk. There's pus collected inside the eye. You see this white level here, discharge, red eye. This is really nasty. This is a very severe corneal, uh, we call it, um, which you don't need to know, microbial keratitis. Basically, it means bugs entered into the cornea. Cause it, it can melt it. It's very, very serious. Someone like this would have to be admitted, absolutely admitted. They'd have to have hourly antibiotic drops day and night. They may even require an injection of antibiotics into the eye. It's actually very, very serious. So if you are a contact lens wearer, if I, I don't wear contact lenses, I'm quite happy with my glasses. I'm looking for my glasses just to show you them, but I'm happy to wear contact lenses. Me as an eye surgeon, I can't, I can't, I cannot put anything in my eye. I don't, begrudge anybody that does but it's just that I just I find it very difficult to have something stuck on my eye but if you are a contact lens wearer I would recommend daily disposable all right some people do monthly disposable if you do monthly disposable you've got to have rigorous hand hygiene you must not wash your contact lenses in tap water because there are bugs in tap water you've got to follow the proper instructions for handling your contact lenses all right or else you could end up and you should never ever ever sleep in contact lenses ever and the reason why you shouldn't sleep in contact lenses is because if you think about it you've got a bit of plastic on the surface of your eye and then you've got your eyes closed how how is your cornea going to be nutritioned it isn't it's it's very very dangerous so please don't do that 
Yes, yeah, so that's what we've just been talking about. Microbial keratitis, which is corneal ulcer. Um, it's associated with contact lens wear. And with more than 90% of the cases, it can be a bug called acanthamoeba. And it's usually from the use of non-sterile water, tap water, to clean the lenses. It's painful, you get redness, watering, and it is an emergency referral to the ophthalmologist, all right? Now, there is a condition that involves your iris, the colored part of your eye, called iritis. And when you get iritis, what happens is that your iris, the colored part, gets very sticky and it sticks to your lens, which is just behind the iris. This is, these are very severe cases. This one at the bottom is a very severe case of iritis. Iritis is a very, quite a common condition actually. And in 98% of the time, it can happen once and it doesn't happen again. But the treatment for iritis is usually steroid drops and dilating drops, drops to pull the iris away, to dilate it, to stop it sticking on the lens behind it. And these are people who have had iritis and we've put the we've put the dilating drops in, but it's stuck here. This one, it's like a flower pattern because it's all stuck down. But usually if you catch iritis early, the iris doesn't stick on the lens and you can get an, a, a dilated pupil, which will give you blurred vision, but it's part of the treatment. It's not a permanent thing. In very severe cases, you can get raised pressure and something called pupil block. Moving further back. So this is the, that's the cornea here. This is the iris and behind is the lens, all right? And you can see the lens has got these little bits of string called suspensory ligaments that attach it to the, something called the ciliary body, which is just behind the iris. So I'm gonna talk about the lens now. The commonest condition that happens in your lens. Now your normal lens is a bit like a glass pebble, all right? It's like a round disc pebble. So that means that when light comes through the cornea, through the pupil, the gap in the middle of the iris, it passes through your lens. And what your lens does is it then converges the light onto your macula at the back of the eye. And that's what gives you very sharp, clear focus when you're looking at objects. Now, when your lens gets cloudy, that is what's known as a cataract, all right? And there are lots of different types of cataracts, all right? We describe them according to what the cloudiness is of your lens, different grades. The commonest risk factor is age. You can't do anything about it. So everybody, as you get older, you will have some form of cataract. Smoking, there's that smoking thing coming in again, can be a risk factor. Expo excessive exposure to sunlight. Remember, we were talking about the sunglasses. So wearing a pair of sunglasses with an ultraviolet filter with the CE mark can reduce the ultraviolet rays that go into your eyes. People who suffer with diabetes can also be more predisposed to um, cataract. But and I'm not saying that being suffering with diabetes definitely, definitely causes cataract. It doesn't. It doesn't cause it in anyone. And even if it does, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have surgery. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And there are certain drugs that can predispose you to cataract, such as steroid. Um, sometimes it can be steroid cream on your face, steroid tablets. Steroids can predispose you to developing cataracts but the symptoms for cataract is blurred vision misty blurred vision that's there all all of the time now the commonest way to treat cataract is cataract surgery but before i go any further what i want to say is that just having cataracts right does not mean that you have to have cataract surgery it's not like suffering with blood pressure, where you have to have blood pressure tablets, you know, to stop you from having a stroke or heart attack or, or whatever. Or if you're suffering with diabetes and you need to be on tablets or insulin, essential for life. Having a cataract, you only need to have surgery 
if it is affecting your day-to-day -day activities. What do I mean about day-to-day -day activities? What I mean by day-to-day -day activities is that when you wake up in the morning and you and you you know you look lovingly at your husband, your partner, whatever, can you see the features of their face, right? When you pick up your newspaper or your book to read, can you read newspaper print or read the print on the book? When you get that letter through the door, can you see with your glasses on if you if you understand by the way, or if you um, public travel by public transport and you're standing at the bus stop, can you see the number on the bus? When you're watching the television, if you are um, like tennis or whatever, can you can you see the TV screen clearly? This is what I mean about your day to day activities, right? If you if you're struggling with your day to day activities and you do not have clarity, and your glasses have been updated and there is no other option then you should possibly think about having a cataract operation. However, if you don't mind living in a sea of blur, <laughs> all right, a bit like having gray hair, some people don't mind having gray hair, some people will dye it to the nth degree, then you don't have to have a cataract operation. If you don't drive, that's the only caveat. If you're a driver and your vision has to be at that 612 vision level and you still want to drive, and if you've got cataracts and you're not at that level, legally, you should not be driving. So you would have to have a cataract operation. All right. So that's my little talking on my soapbox spiel about cataracts, because what I'm finding is that there are a lot of optometrists, opticians who are just referring people left, right and centre into the independent provider to get cataract surgery. All right. So I would say that please do your own shared decision making. And I'm going to share a link at the end where you can look up all of these conditions that I've talked about for free on the internet and you can download the PDFs um, from the RNIB website, which I will do that at the end. All right. So now I'm going to just talk about cataract surgery itself. Well, anyway, when we had the pandemic in 2020, all you know, routine elective surgical procedures were shut down. Um, but and I serve a very I serve a global majority community in Northwest London, and we know that the pandemic hit our community very very badly. So when the hospitals opened up properly in June 2020, uh, my unit was the first unit in London to restart cataract surgery. Um, and that was by working with our community and talking with the people in our community to reassure them that it was safe to come back into the hospital. Now, did you know that the person who invented the laser probe, the, something called the FACO probe that we use to do cataract surgery is a black woman, a black doctor called Dr. Patricia Bath. All right. She is the and we don't hear about this a lot. So I'm just bigging her up here. All right. Um, that she was the she was the first person to who invented the laser probe that we use to do cataract surgery. And cataract surgery, by the way, is the commonest operation in the NHS. We operate on 500,000 people a year. Now, cataract surgery is a very technical thing to do. This is me in theatre. It requires us to use both eyes. So that's me sitting there looking down the operating microscope. You use both hands. I'm using my right hand and my left hand, right? Using both hands on the patient's eye. And I'm using both feet, all right? One is to control the microscope focus and magnification, and the my foot on the right is controlling the machine that's removing the cataract. And you can see up here the screen. And do you know? I mean, it's like magic doing cat. I have to tell you that that doing cataract surgery is just one of the most satisfying operations to do, because you can do a whole cataract operation in about twenty to thirty minutes. With the patient, as you can see, the patient is lying down. There's, they've got a drape covered over them. There's air blowing on the drape. 
they are wide awake and all I'm doing is all they've had in their eye is anesthetic drops, numbing drops and a bit of anesthetic in the eye. And it's like magic. And the patients tell me that they see lots of colors. And because they're awake, I usually have some R&B in the background, a bit of jazz, you know, just to relax. And it's just a really very satisfying operation. Sorry, I went a little bit sort of um, geek like talking about cataract surgery there. All right. Now, so when we do cataract surgery, we have to have the pupil dilated. Um, I train a lot of ophthalmology specialist registrars. So this is a patient who's got a very well dilated pupil, but this is the top, this is the type of cataract I will do. I will be letting my I will be supervising my surgical registrar with a big pupil. Whereas I'm I'm usually doing, although my my registrars are so well trained now that they can handle these more difficult ones with small pupils. So I have to put little hooks in to make the pupil big to be able to do it. And then this is the FACO probe that I was talking about. This is the second instrument that we're using to manipulate. And this is the lens implant that goes in. So when you do cataract surgery, you take out the cloudy lens, but you have to replace it with something to be able to see. The patient needs a lens implant. Normally in the NHS, the lens implant that goes in your eye gives you good vision in the distance without glasses, all right? But you need glasses for reading afterwards. This is a mistake. Oh, that was that iritis, which we've already done anyway. Okay, now this is, um, now we're moving further back. So we've talked about conditions of the lid. We've talked about conditions of the cornea. We've talked about the iris, we've talked about the lens, and now we're gonna talk about the vitreous jelly, all right? The jelly at the back of your eye, all right? Just to gently remind you with my eye anatomy <laughs> lecture today, it seems like when light comes through your eye, it comes and focuses at your macula. It's a tiny, it's, it's smaller than the head of a pin, the macula the rest of your retina you use for your peripheral vision, but it's your macula where you see things and find focus. Now, what happens as a normal degenerative process in the eye is that you can get something called floaters in the eye. They are very common. If you look against a white background, you can see little, like they can look like worms, they can look like little wiggly things, whatever, in the eye. You can get something called a vitreous detachment where the jelly changes from a gel to a liquid and it pulls on the eye, on the retina. And when it pulls away, um, it will cause flushes within the, within the eye, all right? It's stimulating the retina and it's perceived as a flush of light. Then you get the floaters, which can be spots, lines or cobweb effect, all right? So, Flashes and floaters are very common. Now, the important thing to do when you've got flashes and floaters, if they're new, is that you should get it checked out at the opticians. The reason being is that sometimes the jelly can pull away cleanly or what it can do is it can pull a bit of the retina with it and cause a tear or a hole in the retina. All right. So if you have flashes and floaters, get it checked out, get your eye examined, make sure you've got no tear or hole in the retina because that will require urgent treatment. This is somebody, this is look, this is a photograph looking at the back of someone's eye and this person's got a vitreous detachment. They've got this ring-like floater that when we're looking inside the eye, we can see it, all right? But you will see it like a cobweb or like a spider. People might say it's like a spider's web. This is the back of someone's left eye. This is the nerve and these are the blood vessels. Now, the retina, um, as I said, is it's a bit like the film at the back of your eye, right? And if you think of a bit of the, of the retina, a bit like wallpaper on the wall with the air bubble behind it, all right? And if you get a tear, fluid goes in and it can pull the retina off. So this is what I'm talking about with retinal tears. It's really important that if your flushes or your floaters get worse, 
if there is a dark shadow that you cannot see through, if you've got a sudden shower of spots, like thousands of them, like snow or rain or a dark area, a curtain of veil or any change in vision, you've got to get it checked out because it could be a tear or a detachment of the retina. This is a nice slide actually showing the lens, you know, with the ligaments I was telling you about, the jelly and the retina and the maculas there. All right. Now, moving on to the macula, the commonest conditions that happen in the macula is something called age-related macular degeneration, AMD. That affects the central part of the retina that's responsible for you seeing things in fine, clear detail. And there are two types of macular degeneration. There's the wet type. And what we mean by wet is that there's bleeding. And when there's bleeding, you get scarring. This is somebody who had a, who would have bleeding right in the center. And then they got more bleeding on the side. And this is the result. The white is the scarring and it affects your central vision. So when it's affecting your central vision, that means that you have dark patches in the center of your vision. Your outside vision is fine, but your central vision, you cannot see the details and features. So you don't go completely blind. You never go completely blind. You just have got peripheral vision. But that's like rudimentary vision. It's like I could be looking at your face, right? And I can see the features of your face. But if I lost my central vision and I couldn't see the features of your face, my vision on the side, like if I'm wiggling my fingers, you can't, it's difficult to read on the side. So if you get any disturbance of your vision, if you get any, if you look at like the edge of a, of a door or edge of a frame and it's distorted, all right, something called metamorphopsia, distortion of vision, you must get it checked out to make sure that it's not macular degeneration. There are some people who've got an early form of macular degeneration where you've just got these yellow deposits called drusen, all right? They don't necessarily harm, they don't, they don't normally uh, necessarily affect the vision, but somebody who's got any early aging changes have, the, have a high lutein zeathine diet, with the, you know, the kale, the spinach, all of that stuff, because all your macular pigments, your healthy pigments are in spinach, kale, and highly colored vegetables, your red peppers, your green peppers, your yellow, your orange, all those highly colored veg have got a high sources of lutein and zeaxanthine, which is healthy for the macula. So this is early macular degeneration. This is wet macular degeneration. And then there is a condition called dry macular degeneration, dry AMD. And you can see this is the patch of, you don't have abnormal blood vessels, but you just get wear and tear and it can increase in size over time. It's saying that there's no treatment available, but there are clinical trials happening at the moment. Wet macular degeneration is treated with injections. There are clinical trials happening as we speak for dry macular degeneration to delay the progression of the uh, dry macular degeneration. Now, carrying on with with the retina, I, I'm not going to talk too much because I talked about diabetic retinopathy before, and I think it's been recorded that talk. But diabetic people who suffer with diabetes are screened in the Diabetic Eye Screening Program (DESP). Anyone who's diabetic, age 12 and over has to be screened for diabetic eye disease, all right? And it's it, screening is offered because by the time you are having problems with your vision, if you suffer with diabetes, it's, it's too far gone, all right? So you've got to attend your screening appointments, a screening appointments if you suffer with diabetes, if you're age 12 and over, every year, once a year, you've got to have your eyes checked in the screening program to see whether or not you've got any diabetic changes at the back of your eye. And we know that diabetes is, is very common um, in the Black African, Black Caribbean, and the South Asian community compared to our white counterparts. So it's very, very important that you attend your screening appointments and also control your blood sugar, blood pressure, and cholesterol levels. Be compliant with all your medication and maintain a healthy diet exercise regularly even if it's walking your your 10,000 steps I'll be doing that I'm in Newcastle at the moment as I said I'm gonna go for a walk along Tynemouth uh, today just maintain that daily exercise 
And also, um, we used to do this questionnaire, but we actually don't really do it. But, you know, be careful of the foods that you eat. So diabetic retinopathy um, is either treated sometimes, it depends on what level of diabetic eye disease there is with laser treatment, with injections, or sometimes with an operation. All right. So these are not these are chain, diabetic changes at the back of the eye. I'm going to talk very briefly about sickle cell retinopathy because not many people talk about sickle cell retinopathy. But I do a sickle cell retinopathy eye clinic um, once a month. Um, and that's because people people in the people in the in the world, people in the UK don't know what to do with people who are who are suffering with sickle cell disease and not recognizing that people who've got sickle cell disease, it can actually affect your your eyes. And what happens with sickle cell disease? The sickle blood uh, blood cells block the capillaries. It can in your body, it can lead to painful crises. But what happens in the eye in some people? More common if you've got the genotype, something called HBSC, um, but it can, it happens obviously in HBSS and other sickle genotypes like um, beta thal, sickle beta thal, is that you can get abnormal vessels called C fans growing at the edge of the retina. And when these C fans bleed, they can cause problems at the back of the eyes. All right. Um, so, so I offer um, a, a monitoring clinic um, in, in my unit. Now, glaucoma is a disease that affects the optic nerve. And glaucoma is given to a, a group of eye conditions where there's damage to your optic nerve. Um, and when the reason why you get damage to the optic nerve is because of high, higher pressure in the eye than normal. And I and I have to tell you that in um the black community if you if there is a family history of glaucoma or anybody if there's a family history of glaucoma you must get your eyes pressure check once a year at the opticians all right at the optometrists because when glaucoma in black people occurs 10 years early all right 10 years earlier than everybody else all right. So it's very, very important that you have your eye pressure checked. And if you are given treatment, which is usually drops, you must be compliant with the drops because once you damage your nerve, it's game over. All right. It's game over. You lose your peripheral vision. And because usually the commonest cause of glaucoma is open angle glaucoma, people don't know that they are losing their peripheral vision. All right. Until they are left with tunnel vision. So it's very, very important. All right. So there are two types of glaucoma, open or narrow. And it's all to do with the, your eye produces fluid and it drains it out in this angle. All right. This angle. And it can either be open angle. Most likely it's open angle glaucoma or narrow angle where it's narrowing of that angle. When you go to the clinic, you will usually have your eye pressure checked using something like this. It's called a tonometer. And if it's high. So ophthalmology eyes is a combination of coming to the clinic. All right. Having things done, usually diagnostic tests. It's a combination of treatments and procedures within the clinic. And it's a combination of surgery, not just cataract. We do all different types of surgical procedures for different parts of the eye. And I think I wanted to, I wanted to click on this just to show you. I don't know whether it's going to. Oh, let me just end the show. I want to click on. Let me go to the end. All right. I want to just show you this site. So this is the RNIB website. All right. Um, and it's a really good site for, for looking at, you know, different, different conditions. So if you click this bit where it says your eyes. So, for example, if you go to glaucoma, all right, it has this. And then um, it tells you about the different types. But if you go here, it says here, look, download our understanding of glaucoma guide. You can download, right? 
and it brings you up, brings up these, this PDF. Look, understanding glaucoma, all right? And it will go through all the frequently asked questions. It will tell you about all the different types of glaucoma, all right? And you can see I took some of the pictures from this PDF. It's such a good site. You can do it for all different types of um, things. I want to see if I can show you one. There's one about um, dry eyes. AMD, age-related macular degeneration. There's one on cataract, eye examinations, eye safety. And if you can't find what you're looking for, let me just do dry eyes. I'll type dry eyes, right? Look, dry eye, perfect. Look at that. Tells you all about dry eyes. Tells you about the tear film again. You can download the PDF. All right, look, dry eyes, brilliant. It's such a fantastic resource. And then it will then, again, explain, oops, sorry, all different things about it. It'll, it goes through the, the tear film picture I was just telling you about. It will tell you about different types of drops, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is me done. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> that was amazing. It was more than helpful. Thank you so much for that. What fascinating pictures. What fascinating insights into the world of eyes. Now, you know, I started off by saying that the way, I'm a neonatologist. So even in my world, I recognize the importance of, of, of eyes because I find that if the eyes are bright, the baby's doing well. And they're almost, I say that they're the windows into the soul, but that was fascinating, Evelyn. That was fantastic. We do have a, a, a number of um, questions um, and queries. So I'm going to go through some of them. I've tried to group them as well. Um, so somebody's sent a photograph. I don't know whether you've been able to see, see it. Maybe I'll, I'll share my screen so you can see this, the photograph that they've sent. I'm just, of, I'm going to have a look at it in a second. Someone's just asked okay. for the link. The RNIB link. Um, yes, yeah, so I was going to ask the, the, um, the Khan team to put that in the link. Oh. And also, when we send out, well, it's here now. And when we send out the the summary of what we've done this week to include the link as well, because I think that's re a really helpful resource. It's a very helpful resource, honestly. Uh, uh, it's, it's essential. I think everybody should 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 have it. Has somebody already posted it, have they? Yes, they've posted it. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's good. Yeah. That, that was that was just fantastic evening, fantastic. I, I learned a lot, uh, you know, and I, I know many people who have joined us will be will be this. So um, one of the things that struck me about the domiciliary eye test, now I've seen the adverts on TV, so it's not just spec savers that do the domiciliary. Oh God, spec savers, all right, don't tell, don't let me, don't let me trust <laughs> spec savers online. No, we shouldn't, but, but I, I saw the advert, I thought that's so visionary. You know, that's, excuse the pun, but um, you can get it even if you don't want to go to Specsavers. Yeah, you can. I'm sure if you contacted your local optometrist and asked them, ask, just ask them if they offer this as a service, but it's available on the NHS. Okay. Um, the, one of the questions that you'll have a look at, the, and it's very similar, this photograph that um, somebody has posted about his, his, his mother's condition. Um, he said that if it goes away, it does not go away permanently and it keeps on flaring up. I what think you talk about that. You talk the um, swelling of ble blepharitis. blepharitis. It's, yes. chronic. It's, it's a chronic is chronic. condition, is it? This is, right, so get him to go online, download the, dr download the uh, dry eye um, PDF and it will explain to you properly how to do lid hygiene and all the other treatments you can do. It describes lid hygiene properly. It's a chronic problem and it's about managing. Once you stop, it comes back. So you have to do it again. So what his mum needs to do when she's doing her lid hygiene, maybe if she does showers in the shower, do the, you know, when I was talking about the hot bathing, have that flannel, yes. do it there, put it on your closed eye. And then with the flannel, Sometimes people find it very difficult to do the cotton bud thing, you know, dipping it in the bud and then putting like yeah, putting eyeliner on in the shower with the flannel, with the eyes, just gently close, just rub like this. Right. And that will help to lift off the flakes. But it's a continuous thing. You have to do lid hygiene twice a day if it's really serious. Morning and night. Thank yeah. you. Um, I was glad that you busted some myths as well because I'd heard that one about if you wear glasses if you continue to wear glasses it'll make your eyes worse so that is a really good myth buster because I still hear that now 
Yeah, because if you don't wear glasses, you give yourself a headache. Yes. If you don't think you're doing yourself any favors, like people will say things like, oh, I don't want to wear those glasses. Oh, I, and then they strain their eyes, giving themselves a headache. All right. Why would you do that? If you need glasses, you need glasses. All right. So it's, to, the, I mean, we're, we're really blessed in this country. There, I mean, I was 20, um, two weeks ago, I, I was at a vision aid talk and um, there are countries a lot of you know sub-Saharan African countries where they can't they can't even get a pair of glasses. Children cannot get glasses. You know people can't have glasses to do their work because the manufacturing process. All right. So if you've got glasses, consider yourself blessed, consider yourself privileged, and use them. I'm using mine, as you can see. I know I've got <laughs> mine, so I use them for distance. Yeah. Okay, um, someone's asked about um, advising about eye drops. That yeah. isn't, um, they said that, can you advise and give more information about certain, if, if certain eye drops cause inflammation or cysts to the back of the eye for glaucoma patients? No, there's, right, so, right, they're talking about two different things. Cysts, they're talking about cysts, which is at the front. The glaucoma is, is something else. Let me talk about glaucoma because glaucoma is affects our community quite badly and quite significantly. And um, and um, we've got to be, you see, let me tell you something. There is so much medical inequity, all right? Medical health inequity. And the reason why there is medical health inequity is because, um, Global majority populations, and what I mean by the global majority, I mean people who identify as Black, African, Caribbean, Indian, Indigenous, you know, non-white, are not um, treated properly in clinical trials. So we will have clinical trials which will be very much white population dominated, not because it's not affecting Black or global majority communities, is because of all the medical racism in the past, where there have been clinical trials and there's not been ethics employed. So my advice to everybody is that if you are offered to participate in a clinical trial, please do it if you're from the global majority. So we can have that data and we can have that evidence because it's very white majority dominated, do you understand? So a lot of the evidence that we have is from a white, you know, dominated population. But what we do know for glaucoma is it does affect black people 10 years earlier. And because it affects people um, us 10 years earlier, it's usually a very difficult disease to manage. So if you are offered drops to treat the pressure, you must use them. If they say that you are better off if it's caught early, having laser treatment, have that laser treatment. If they say you need surgery, have that surgery. But what I don't want to happen is what happened with somebody that I met from Ghana who had a strong family history of glaucoma, never went for eye tests, even though they were advised by their mother to do so. And in their forties, had damaged their nerves so badly that they lost the vision in one eye. It's so advanced because it's a silent cause of blindness if it's not treated, because it's not painful, all right? So that's why if you've got a strong family history, get the pressure check once a year. As soon as the pressure is greater than 21, you're supposed to be referred into the hospital eye service. You then come under the care of a glaucoma specialist, all right? Yeah, I know lots of people don't like drugs, medicines, this. They like to do all this herbal stuff. All right, do your herbal stuff, but take the medicines. <laughs> the same, you can do all the herbal stuff you want, but don't substitute it for the medication that we have been blessed, that has been created and is available in this country, all right? Take advantage. Thank you. That's a really powerful message. And if that gets through to even a couple of people, that's great. 
Um, so this is a problem that I think lots of people have, especially since we've started using our computers. Yes, acute, somebody everything. said acute, acute pain from glaucoma can be fatal. Yeah. That is yeah. Acute angle closure is extremely painful. That is an emergency that is treated with laser treatment. But the commonest, the commonest cause of glaucoma in our community is open angle glaucoma. I don't want people to think that, oh, I've got to have pain before I get treated, right? Acute angle glaucoma, acute angle closure glaucoma just presents into us. Do you understand? In, in ophthalmology, it hardly even goes past go, all right? But make the, the commonest cause of glaucoma, open angle is not painful. It needs to be addressed. It needs treatment. It needs attending appointments. Don't delay. Okay, I'm going to try and get through as many questions as possible. I've got 10 minutes left. So um, this will affect lots of people, dry eyes and computers. Oh yes, um, definitely. Anything to um, do the 20, 20, 20 thing I said, after 20 minutes, rest your eyes, look at something 20 foot away. I don't know what that is in meters. It's six, six meters. Look at um, something six meters away, but it doesn't go in the 20, 20, 20, 20 feet away. All right. Yeah. And, um, okay. and do it for 20 seconds and blink, blink. You see the way you get your tears every time you blink, you get a wash of tears on your eye. But when we're on screens, we're like this, like this, we're not blinking. And then your eyes get dry, all right? And if you need to supplement your tears because you've got dry eyes, then, then get some dry eye drops. I'm probably not allowed to brand things, but I like using a combined, I like using a sodium hyaluronate with no preservatives and no phosphates. That's, what, that's my personal preference because I do get dry eyes. Okay. Another thing, someone's asked, can you correct, is the, can you correct short-sightedness permanently? Well, I mean, you can if you want, well, it's, I don't, permanently, I wouldn't say the word permanent, but some people do laser corrective laser. surgery to correct it. I, am I worried permanent. about laser? I'm sure it's great, but there's still so many ophthalmologists that wear glasses. Yeah, I wear my glasses. Yeah, I, they'll have short-sighted, <laughs> everybody. Yeah, I just think, you know. What but do they I mean, know that I don't, you know, so I, I, I'm, <laughs> keep, I'm not doing the laser thing, but uh, but it, there is, a, you can't do laser. Yeah, you um, can't do laser, but it's not permanent. You get a bit of regression. It's not permanent. And also when you have your, when you then get to have your cataracts done, there's a special correction factor that they need to, to do to, to correct for the fact that you've had laser surgery. Because basically what you're doing is you're, sh you're changing the shape of your cornea. I'm not against, you know, corneal refractive surgery. I just, I just don't do it. And I just, wouldn't have it on myself I just because I, I I value my eyes need it for my job um so but if you do decide that you want to do it you've got to go to a reputable surgeon because remember it's the it's the clear window at the front of the eye all right um uh, let's see it again um there was yeah there were some people have got old glasses that are still in good condition, but they've just changed them. How would you go about donating these? Is there, there do you know, if there's any avenues for yes, giving them? There's, there's, I think there's something. I think on. I think with check on the Sight Savers website. Usually in hospital eye services, they will have um, a depository, a repository for people to donate glasses. Um, if you check on the RNIB website, they may be able to signpost you too. Okay. But thank you um, for that person who's considering that. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you so much. You no, know, with cataracts, is is it an inevitable consequence of growing old? Will you? Will that yeah. will, So yeah. if you're ninety nine, but, but it doesn't. But it doesn't. Listen, I, I think the oldest person I've operated on for cataract surgery was was older than ninety. Okay. And that's when they that, that's when it's that's when it was impacting their day day to day activities. But as I was just saying, Ngozi, just having cataracts does not mean you have to have an operation. Yeah, that's fine. You only need to do it if you want to. It's one of those things that really, if you want to, you can do it. If you don't, don't think you're doing anything wrong. So if you still have some vision, but if you've got if, vision you and it's not, if you're not being impacted by your day to day activities, why would you? You don't. Be, you don't fix something that's not broken. Yeah. So if you can still watch the telly, do everything do that practice. you need to do. You yeah. don't need to do anything. No. But if you, I suppose, if you're driving and you need six, if you're a driver and yeah. your vision is below the legal 
level the driving, then you will have to if you want to continue driving. Yeah, but there are lots of people who have got cataracts, but it's not below the legal level. It depends on the grade or the density. Okay, um, they have eye drops that for sort of making your eyes brighter. I don't know what that means. Yeah, <laughs> they said it's advisable to use eye drops even when you have certified healthy eyes. Well, I don't know. I don't even know what that is. Yeah, you know, well, it's a question. You know, as soon as, listen to me. Listen to me. I'm a very <laughs> old-fashioned. I'm an old-fashioned doctor. Right? <laughs> if not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just do that. That's your answer. Healthy diet. Healthy diet. The fact diet. that you said healthy eyes have, is have, the answer to have, the question. Have bright it? eyes with a healthy diet. That's my advice. <laughs> oh, it's in the chat. I thought I'd put it to you. Um, right. um, the same milk. <laughs> yeah. And, and then I think it was um, when you talk about cataracts, that when you remove them, that you still need a correction, is it? Yes, so let me explain. On the NHS, on the National Health Service, right, you will have you can have usually two, maybe three options for after what you do afterwards. Usually, commonly, most people will have a lens implant put in their eye that gives you focus for distance because your normal lens, your normal lens with the little ligaments, right? It changes shape for distance and near. All right. So it can accommodate. You can focus for distance or you can focus for near if you, you know. But when you've got um, a lens implant, it's a bit of plastic. So usually people are either focused for distance without glasses. All right. So they've been given distance vision or people who are very short sighted, who like wearing glasses and feel naked without them, don't want to have to take their glasses off for distance. They normally take their glasses off to read. So they are given reading vision, some of them. So you can either have distance vision, majority go for that, or you can have near vision. When I'm saying distance vision or near vision, I mean vision without glasses for distance, vision without glasses for near. But for the other opposite, you need the glasses. There is something called a multifocal lens which is not available on the NHS. That's why I asked because you specifically said yeah. NHS. So I thought maybe there's something yes. else available. So, on the, so, 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 so basically privately, you can have a multifocal lens, but let me give you a caveat. And I don't do private practice, right? Let me give you a caveat. The, if you went to see a surgeon who, who and they offered you uh, cataract surgery, and they, they, the first thing they would ask you is that, are you all right wearing reading glasses? If you said yes, they would not talk about multifocal lenses. So I'll tell you the reason why. The reason why is a multifocal lens, which lets you see for distance, middle and near with no glasses, you get halos around lights. Halos, you get rings, this, 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 this ring effect. Everybody who has a multifocal lens will have this halo ring effect. But there are some people that hate glasses so much that they will put up with that halo ring effect around lights. So they don't mind. So they will go for multifocal lens. But even so, even privately, and the reason why the surgeons won't give you the, the and if they did give you the multifocal, they would warn you about this halo effect. It happened to a patient of mine. She went to uh, India, she had cataracts because you know, sometimes in India you can get it cheap. She came back and she was like, Miss Mensa, I'm seeing all these rings around lights. And I said, didn't the surgeon tell you? And she had a multifocal lens. I was like, didn't the surgeon tell you that they put a multifocal in and you're gonna get rings around lights? Gosh, that's not good. <laughs> It's about informed consent. Informed consent. Because if you decided that you wanted to have that, then that's fine. But if you didn't. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of more questions. So one is, if you don't treat cataracts, will they eventually lead to blindness? No, I don't think you can say that. I mean, some cataracts do advance quite quickly. Rarely, we do get some people who end up with something called white cataract. All right. Which is, I mean, that one, I mean, you can't see a thing. I'd highly recommend. It's like looking, through, you cannot see a thing. The vision's counting fingers, hand movements, that level of cataract you should do. But what I would say is you don't do it in anticipation of that happening. If that happens, then you do the operation. And then can you slow down cataracts with supplements? Because some optometrists offer... No, they don't. They're just trying to sell you some money. They're trying, listen, people... Let me let me speak. 
right? Speak. Let me speak. <laughs> speak. And not, and not try and trash the optometrist who are trying to <laughs> sell you pairs of glasses and sell you drops and supplements that do nothing. All right. Listen to what I just said. Re- listen to the recording. Everything said. There is no supplement. There is no nothing. There is no anything that will reduce the progression of cataract. The thing you should do is that if you're in a very highly sunny environment, use glasses with a UV filter that's got the CE mark. Have a healthy diet, all right, which helps your macula. That's what you should do. Okay, so it's quarter past now. Um, Just one more comment. Somebody has said that there's also, I think if you can put this in the information you send out, Khan, about there's got a charity that sends um, glasses to surgery as well, Vision Arcade, if you can put that in the blurb. But Evie, thank you so much. That was amazing. There's been so many comments that they've just loved your presentation. Uh, I think we'll have you back soon again, because this was just fantastic. It's very important to speak truth to power. All right. I'm I'm a no filter. Speak say it as it is. Speak speak the truth. And, and that's, that's why you... and that's why you're you're here. And and that's why uh, we know that people who dial into this find these really really valuable because they've got the opportunity to speak to um, people from our community that will just give them the unvarnished truth about things um, and tell them what they need to hear so that we can take control of our own health. All right. So thank you. So much. Oh my absolute pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Annabelle now. Thank you, Dr. Ngozi. Um, It's been a very wonderful um, session. Thank you for hosting the session. Just you've you've done a fantastic job, just like you've always done. Thank you so, so much. And to Miss Evelyn, wow. That was a wonderful presentation, fantastic response to questions. Thank you so much. It was very insightful and informative. You know, for some of us, we actually think that, you know, we need to go check our eyes only when, you know, there are issues. But today, I personally have learned so much from it. Thank you so much. And to everyone who has been in this session today, thank you for being part of it. And um, before we go, I would like to take you through some of our upcoming events and some of our services. The slide speaks. Can I have the slides, please? Yeah, just bear with me one second. Okay, maybe I can go with what I have here. Let's... Hello, Sam, can I just go with what I have? Yes, please, yeah, sorry, my system's been a bit slow. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Not too sure. Okay, it's just like we had today, we had the um, health hour session. We have another one coming up next week, Saturday, which is the 29th of July, 2023. Same time, 11 to 12, 15 p.m. And we'll be talking about lifestyle practices and womb cancer. And for you to be part of this session, please register with this email, info at calm.com.uk. And we also have the legal drop-in sessions. Thus, we give you the opportunity to get to know the legal issues that um, families and individuals within the Caribbean and African communities you know, face and give you a lot of insight and information on legal issues. And um, this will be happening on the 27th of July, 2023. And um, it's going to be... Um, a general discussion is going to be more like an open floor discussion on that day. And our speaker for the day is Dr. Singh Vic. 
And for you to register, you scan the, the QR code, or you can as well send an email to advocacy at can.org.uk. Then we also have our Healthy Hearts, which talks about nutrition. And I also believe that health starts with you know, what we eat. So for you to also get more insight and information on this, and this happens every Tuesday. And the next one will be on the 25th of July, 2023. And it will be at 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. We have our guest speaker, Jasmine Carbon, who will be speaking to us on that day. And for you to register, please send an email to health at can.org.uk. So we also have our cost of living survey. And um, this helps us to understand, you know, um, cost of living crisis and issues we have within the community. And we also want you to take part in this survey. And um, you can see below, I'm sure this will be in the chat box, the link where you can click and complete the survey. Now talking about our services, we have counseling services, we provide counseling services and um, for you to um, benefit from the service, you can contact us on 077-10022382, or you can send an email to roslyn at can.org.uk and as well to health and wellbeing at can.org.uk. And we also have the Green and Arts Wellbeing Services, and which you can as well benefit from. Um, this you can take part in this in two different hubs, which we have at Stockport, Stockport Hub, and um, the time is 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. We have the Bolton Hub, which is 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. For more information on this, please send an email to Green and Arts Wellbeing at can.org.uk. Or you can as well send us in, um, give us a call on 077-899-75205. Yes, just like I said, we have, have an upcoming event. So save the date for the Black History Month, which is um, coming up on the 28th of September, 2023 at Manchester Cathedral, Victoria Streets. So, um, Come, let's celebrate the Black history. And um, if you want more information on how to book stall on that day, send an email to events at can.org.uk. Yes, we want to use this opportunity to say thank you to our partners. Um, thanks to Caribbean and African Health Network. And... Um, Enfield Caribbean Association and um, the RAF International Development Agency. We have the Royal Assembly Redeemed Christian Church of God. Then we have the Crydon BM Forum, the Black Health Initiative. Thank you so much for being part of today's session. And it's been awesome having you here today. And we're hoping to see you next week, Saturday, as you come along, not just you alone, with your friends and families who will also benefit from this session. Thank you and goodbye. Welcome to our Caribbean and African Targeted Health Improvement Program, CAFIP Health Hour. The Caribbean and African Health Network, CAN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating and giving space to black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members and friends. Some weeks will vary and will include other panel members such as pharmacists, specialist nurses and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell and many more. 
We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences and ask questions to our black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATHIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund.